Hello, this is Stephanie. And this is Brian. Welcome to the making and the remaking of A Codependent Mind. We're going to continue our discussion that we started last time around the topic of sex. This time, pivot to a discussion about sexual trauma specifically. It looks like we're going to have actually three parts to this discussion. The next episode, we'll talk about sexual healing. But as you say, this one is going to focus on the difficult topic of sexual trauma. One thing I read that was interesting, we often think about PTSD as most commonly associated with combat situations. I think that's where the term and the understanding of of the phenomena first arose and was discussed. But the experience that most commonly causes PTSD is actually sexual assault or rape. Up to 90% of people who experience sexual assault or rape will have symptoms sometimes persisting for years of PTSD. Mm -hmm. Complex PTSD is what they call trauma that isn't about one event. Yeah, we actually addressed that topic in our second episode of the first season. So you didn't experience sexual assault or rape? No. In the way that is traditionally understood. But we're going to start talking about this period of your two long-term abusive relationships. And those relationships... And that abuse involved sexual abuse as well. Right. And caused pretty significant sexual trauma. Yeah, similarly to how we explained just abuse in general, how a lot of people kind of go to this view of physical abuse being more serious or being taken more seriously um, when emotional abuse is, is can be equally damaging. And the same really goes for sexual abuse and sexual trauma. It's It's pretty much the same situation can be devastating yeah even if if it doesn't involve direct physical violence right since this is a the second part of a three-parter i'm gonna do a sum up of the last episode Mm -hmm. okay and why then you can kind of tell me if i got anything wrong or if i'm missing pieces sure that sounds good so in the last episode we introduced this topic in a similar way that we introduced the whole podcast with a story about the origins of your, let's say, sexual codependency. You didn't experience sexual trauma directly, either in your friendship with G or in your family of origin or within your religion, say. Those Mm -hmm. are all possible sources. But the non-sexual trauma that you did experience compromised your developing sexuality in similar ways that it compromised your social development, your emotional development, your sense of self, in that you were conditioned to feel shame. Other people's anger or frustration or disappointment or sadness, you internalized as shame. There was something wrong with you. You were unworthy, deficient, or weak because they were angry or disappointed or frustrated. So you were ready to feel shame at any moment. Your shame receptors were on high alert And even though you were not actively shamed by your family or your church around the issue of sex, you did witness active shaming within your peer group. So Boy Scouts or at school, you mentioned, you absorbed that shame, even though it wasn't necessarily directed at you. And you also absorbed the larger shame messages that were and are present both in your peer groups and in our larger surrounding culture. Essentially, you had no defenses against sexual shame. If there was a shame message around sex, you absorbed it. So you weren't given any defenses by your family or peer groups in in terms of people helping you understand and navigate the sexual world. And then any defenses that you had kind of internally had been chipped away by your friendship with Jay and by your kind of chaotic family environment. So you entered the sexual arena already feeling shame, already feeling unworthy, deficient, weak, And any messages that you received that seemed to confirm that shame, for instances, messages around being a virgin, there are definitely shame messages that are sent out from our culture, but that's Mm -hmm. a shameful thing. You absorb those messages and added it to your shame bucket. And any messages that you might receive that would disconfirm that shame, that you were sexually worthy, that you were not deficient because you had no experience, you would ignore those messages or see them as not real. Mm Mm-hmm. And any pleasure that you were developing around sex, say with masturbation, was already clouded with shame, such that sexual desire itself 
became almost a painful emotion. It's supposed to be a pleasurable emotion. Mm -hmm. It became a painful emotion because like many of your emotions, it was always in danger of leading to shame. Wanting to have sex became more about escaping the pain of not having sex, the shame of not having sex, than accessing the pleasure that sex provides. You were not motivated by sexual desire. You were motivated to find someone who would find you sexually desirable because their, their desire would relieve you of that shame, would prove that you are worthy. But for most of your 20s, the fear of not performing successfully in that situation prevented you from even trying to find someone who might find you sexually desirable. Mm -hmm. But where we left off with you last episode, in your late 20s, you had moved to a new city, you had decided to give yourself a fresh start, and you felt somewhat ready to put aside some of that shame and fear and to, as you said, put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. How does that sound? Is that a reasonable yeah, sum up? That, that sounds like a really good sum up. Yeah. It, it comes down to my motivation for wanting a sexual experience kind of at that point, up to that point, it was never about seeking pleasure. Like you said, that was not my motivation. I wasn't interacting with people and going, wow, that person's interesting or attractive. I want to get to know them. So I could maybe the motivation was I need to be doing this. This needs to be happening for me. I feel awful. That is not, I feel super nervous. That is not, I feel shame. I feel shame that it's not. Obviously, I feel it says something about me. Yeah, right. That and and everyone's going to see that too. So, like you said, during these the twenties, I probably got all kinds of signals from people, or, or just I made connections that I just ignored because I didn't trust it. It yeah, like you said, it was probably going to lead to shame somehow. Like it just, I was like, no, this isn't this isn't legit for some reason. Because if my feelings were involved, I didn't trust my feelings. And it seemed like my feelings always led to shame. So I just really didn't trust my experience. What I what was really going to get me an experience, basically, most likely at this point in, in the story, is someone else just taking all the control <laughs> of the situation. And that's unfortunately what happened. That is exactly what happened. Although not immediately, you did start to kind of exercise some agency. Yeah, right. So I was feeling good. I mean, this it was false confidence um, because I thought that I had somehow managed to overcome my depression and social anxiety and all these things. And, and I felt, wow, maybe I can do this. But still, my motivation was very much, what are these people going to think of me? I feel actually pretty good. So maybe they'll think I am okay. You know, it's still performance oriented. Still performance. I can still do this, this yes, thing I that you needed this. to do to prove yourself. Right. I could, I could basically start to imagine people being interested in me, but it's still that. I can imagine people being interested in me. So you did ask some people out? Yeah, and those were good experiences. I remember having a couple of good dates that I thought could have gone somewhere, and it seemed I felt a connection. I felt a connection. So it very well could have gone in a good direction. If nothing else bad happened, like say I didn't meet somebody that, that interrupted that flow. Interestingly, though, you told me these were a series of first dates, and, mm -hmm. and you said that the second date, the possibility of the second date, with any of these people, I think you said about four people you had gone on first dates with? Oh, it was three before. Okay, three yeah. people. The, the second date was causing you more anxiety than yes. the first even. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is probably kind of a normal thing for a lot of people, right? I mean, just this like the game of dating sort of, you know, like I, but I had, I had no experience with it and I had a severe judgments of myself. So even though I managed to feel good enough for that first date, yeah, the second date was like, ooh, well, I can't express too much interest or like how quickly do I respond? Do I ask him again? Like what kind of date should the second date be? Just all these paralyzing thoughts. I was ready to go down that road, but it was just very, I was giving me a lot more pause than it did even just at doing asking for the first date. Perhaps you didn't anticipate the first date going well. So you would, weren't be. even thinking, trying. you didn't imagine how you would move beyond it. Yeah. Or I was just hoping probably subconsciously that they would lead that or something. Regardless, you didn't get an opportunity because R appears. And you said you met her at work, but she was not someone that you particularly were interested in. Right. There was a social media connection. Yes. And she exploited that connection almost immediately to begin the love bombing. Yeah. 
and part of the problem was that I was the one that sent the social media invite, not because I was interested in her, but because we had had a couple of conversations sure. through, through work. And yeah. I, that's kind of what I was doing at the time. I was new to city. And every time I had like, oh, that was a decent conversation. Maybe it wasn't the best approach, but I don't know. I'm just trying to gather people well, to, we all do to that, be right. connected to. Yeah. But yeah, she took that, I think, as a like, oh, he's an opening. interested. Uh, yeah, he, an opening. So yeah, she sends me a message on there and then it, it's not work related anymore and that very first day was just um, non-stop conversation non-stop love bombing and sexually charged conversation and we want to make sure that we're keeping the timeline front and center here because mm-hmm. i think those of us who haven't experienced love bombing don't understand how intense it is and how quickly it happens so you send the social media invite her first response is a love bombing response and initiates a conversation immediately that yeah. lasts all day. Yes. And we talked about love bombing, but I'm not sure that we were clear that in that first conversation, there included sexual discussion. Yes. And suggestions that there was a sexual opening for you. With yeah. Her. Which up to that point hadn't happened for me. And well, I it, was it's, kind of desperate for it to happen. Well, it's never happened to me at all. Right. In my life, I've never had a first conversation with someone where they've turned it sexual. So this is not a, you know, this is not a common occurrence. So it's no wonder that you found it destabilizing. Well, it was, to me, it was, it was, it was validation, right? I mean, I'm sure it was also exciting. Yeah. Right. So yeah, those discussions continued every day. We worked together. So we went on walks together. So this is, a, again, this sounds like, oh, this could have been months. This was the first week. The first week. So from the moment she's given an opening on social media, every day that first week, there is love bombing that includes sexual validation, Mm -hmm. sexual suggestion, but also the beginning of sexual abuse. Yes. In that she's using sex to belittle you and to insult you. Yeah. So I had this fear, as we talked about in the first episode or the, the previous episode, about being exposed, you know, being exposed for being inexperienced, but for being a virgin all those kind of things. And my thought was with with that fear really was that someone would find it out and go, Oh, I don't I don't want to get with this person. I, I, I don't want an inexperienced person. That was it. Basically they, they would just leap. You just be rejected. Yeah. Instead what she did was totally unexpected, right? She was sexually validating me, but then somehow within that first conversation, she did figure out that I was a virgin. She said, You're a virgin, aren't you? You know, and then just started kind of teasing me about it. But wasn't doing what I expected, which was to walk away, right? And so it was kind of, well, I, it's kind of like, I'll, I'll give you a chance here, you know, even though I, I think this is silly that you've made it this far into life and have, have never had sex. Yeah, so you should be ashamed about it and embarrassed by it, but I'm going to rescue you. Yes. And then in that first week, you were over at her apartment mm-hmm. and you had a makeout session, I guess you would describe it. Yeah. And what was that like? It was right along the same lines. Just kissed for a little bit. And then um, she started teasing me about the kissing. Really more insulting in, in that particular case. was just like, you're terrible at that. Like, wow, your, your face is so stiff. You seem like, you know, a little kid. All these just like, that was, that was terrible. Let me show you how to do it. And so this kind of creating this power dynamic just right there from the, from the first week. But still sex is going to happen here. Like I'm kind of like making that clear. Sex is going to happen, but it's going to, but you're you're very subservient. So this is really kind of classic trauma bonding. Yeah. And we had the episode on trauma bonding in the first episode. It has all the kind of classic components. There's a power dynamic that she sets up and enforces. Mm-hmm. Even more critically in these early days, because she can't rely on that power dynamic because you could leave. Right. The abuse is intermittent. Right. She's giving you two messages. One, you're shameful. You're weak you're deficient, you're unworthy. Mm -hmm. The second message is she is the only pathway to get out of that shame. Right. So she causes fear and shame in you, fear that you'll never have a sexual experience because you're bad at kissing because you're a virgin. Mm -hmm. And then she says she's the one that's going to relieve that fear and shame. Yes. She's the only one. You can't go out there. How are you going to go out there now and go back to one of these other women that you took on a date because right. you've now been told that you're a terrible kisser and that, there were, that you're a virgin is a shameful thing. Right. And there were lots of other things intertwined to this that were kind of only indirectly related. Like oh, your hair is terrible. You're, you dress terribly. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go shopping with you and, and help clean this up. It, yeah. 
you you look ridiculous basically and you are ridiculous but hey you know i <laughs> i find you attractive still and and let's make this happen so this is now this is now the trauma bond and in fact what you go back and do from this kissing session or from these interactions is go back and essentially decide oh she's the one that you have to pursue and you yeah abandon the other relationships that you were slowly beginning to cultivate yeah it took me a while to remember but once i did i remembered this exact thought process of going home that first night after basically being told i was a terrible kisser and thinking what should i do next here i went on on a couple of good dates with a couple of people that i really found intriguing i didn't find this person all that intriguing and she was insulting me but i felt compelled to her for some I just, I didn't really know why. Mm -hmm. And I immediately came in with the stories, the post hoc rationalizations to try to cover up the fact that I felt extremely drawn to this person, the worst choice of the bunch, (laughs) just because she was doing this, you know, I got immediately trauma bonded. Uh, My codependent behaviors just kicked in immediately. They were totally activated in that she was the one that was causing you pain and shame and fear. So she was the one you needed to focus on in order to relieve that shame and pain and fear. Yeah. So I came up with the meat story that night that like kind of the, oh, I sent the social media uh, invite because I was interested in her and then kind of explained seeing her walk around the office as as me being interested in her and, and gave some like, oh, I like the way you walked and your dog and all this stuff. And and came up with a story that I continue to tell for years to come. I think you told me that yeah. originally as well. I think well. I was still telling that story. So this is your, the meat story, meaning the kind of meat cute. You you, yeah. you rewrote the, the way that you began as if mm-hmm. you had some agency and yes. you had made the choice. That I her. chose her. Yeah. So then comes the first sexual experience. Yeah. Five days in. Five days in. So this was a continuation of what I basically expected. It was similar to the kissing experience but not necessarily, oh, you're terrible, this kind of mother-child atmosphere, like this, okay, I'm going to guide you through this, and stuff like that. This Mm -hmm. very condescending, the opposite of sexy, uh, not generating desire. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Basically just capitalizing on the fact that I was clearly nervous about the whole thing, and just her having a lot of fun with it, and me not. Yeah, It was a terrible experience. Um, Yeah, I mean, I went home that night i think i did go home yeah i went home that night and just yeah i had a lot of reservations but didn't know how to explore those reservations and and immediately just continued writing stories that oh no this is this is good i'm really glad she gave me this this chance this opportunity it's like she gave me a gift so there was this sense of maybe relief that it was happening to you at least yeah it's like it's finally it's finally happened i kind of almost remember those exact words going Mm -hmm. through my head i can't believe this is finally happening to me so even though it was not a pleasurable experience, at least there was the relief from the pain that you felt, and the shame that you felt for not having had sex. Yeah. And then this kind of intermittent abuse that included the sexual abuse, including belittling you for sex, but also validating you. You're yeah. terrible and deficient and unworthy, but I'm going to have sex with you right. and I'm going to express sexual excitement about you for some reason. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That continued over those first few weeks in which it became from a simple social media invite. Within weeks, it became this intense, overwhelming relationship. Mm -hmm. After the fifth week, I moved out of my apartment into her apartment. Yeah. And um, five months later, she asked me to marry her. (laughs) Or she didn't ask, really. Well, no, it it wasn't like, a will you marry? It was like, oh, what do you think about getting married on a cruise ship? You know, it was like just this kind of assumption that that's what where this was going. But yeah, I think the sex was, was a huge distraction from any sort of reservations I might've had about anything that was happening really. I mean, cause the intermittent abuse dynamic, what happens with that is you go from abuse to reward. I mean, a lot of times, eventually it's just abuse to relief that you're not being abused. But in this point, it was these bigger swings of abuse to validation. Cause at one point she told you this was the best sex she's ever had. She said that a number of times during that first six months, and so that was just like, wow, not only am I, you know, that was I worried that I was never going to have it. Now this person's saying I'm, I'm really good at it. That's amazing. Wow. But then at some point later, she's again mocking you about it or belittling you. Right. Yeah. So how can I get back to that moment when she was saying it was this was the best sex that she's ever had? I mean, there's never any point in here where I'm still I'm, I'm still not thinking about what I want 
obviously I'm not, I'm not practiced in, in seeking out desire. So that's not, I'm still seeking validation at this point. I'm seeking ways of relieving the shame from the abuse that is also happening. As the months progress, as you said, she's decided that you're going to get married. Mm -hmm. She's decided that you're going to have a vasectomy. Mm -hmm, Yeah. She doesn't want children. So months in, then she decides actually you're not good at sex at all right and you're doing it all wrong yeah then then uh kind of out of nowhere it it became this narrative that i wasn't initiating it in a way that made her feel desired you know it just didn't seem like i was i passionately wanted her which is true (laughs) (laughs) right but you didn't absorb you didn't you weren't able to absorb that message and say well yeah that's true i don't actually want you because you're treating me horribly you absorbed it as shame you were yes. you were deficient you weren't making her feel the way that she was entitled to feel so then we right. see this kind of narcissism entitlement that she's entitled to the sex that she wants and uh and then the other person doesn't matter at all right so yeah th- this started so this was maybe i don't know six months in it started this never-ending quest from there forward for the next eight years of trying to figure out what was the problem with me and why i wasn't good at initiating sex that was kind of the at the heart of the abusive experience with R. so we've talked about in previous episodes about abuse and how it happened and gave some examples but really that was at the heart of it and that's what she came to say was the only problem with the relationship was sex we were otherwise an amazing couple the problem wasn't sex the problem was that you were not sexually desirable or enough right for her to feel desire and you needed to completely change yourself i needed to completely and- change myself and along with that change the way she felt about herself so being the way i initiated being like this kind of passionate i can't resist you sort of thing and you know being a narcissist Narcissism also being rooted in shame. She needed you to convince herself that she was sec- sexually desirable. Mm-hmm. You can't do that. <laughs> right. So this was a losing battle. One thing that happened during this period, almost immediately, actually, right after this shift that kind of made the power dynamic get, just get completely pinned out of whack was this problem with premature ejaculation that I started having that I didn't have before. And that became part of the problem also. This and part of her narrative that you were sexually deficient. Right. Yeah. So that, that was tied to... So it, she, start, she started on this quest of trying to organize all of my problems. It was kind of like she was playing this abusive therapist where she's saying, well, it's because you lack confidence. So you're not initiating well because you lack confidence or, and you lack masculinity. You have this PE problem because of the same thing, confidence, masculinity. Everything that she was insulting me for up to that point started to get looped in. So like my posture, the way I did everything, the way I spoke to people, the way I related to our friends when we would hang out with people, everything went into this bucket. And then the more and more and more that she put those things into that bucket, the more I just took that on as, wow, I'm completely deficient in every way. My entire personality is suspect here. And this was all a way for her to avoid her own sexual dysfunction. So people often ask people who are abused, why did you stay? But an even more compelling question is to ask the abusers, why do they stay? Right. So this was a woman who months into a sexual relationship decides that she's not sexually attracted to her partner, that he's sexually deficient, and decides not only to stay in the relationship, but to marry him. Yeah, And as the years progress, she decides he's not only deficient sexually, but deficient in so many other ways, an unworthy partner of her. She doesn't leave. Why doesn't she leave? What is it that she needs so desperately to stay and abuse you and tear you down? Those are the people that we should be talking to, the abusers. Why are you staying? What is wrong with you are that you continually made the choice to stay in this relationship? Yeah. Well, and I brought that up near the end of the relationship in couples therapy and the answer was well you duped me you yeah. you, you you convinced me to right. give you a chance right which is an obvious lie in it so you mentioned premature ejaculation that is often a, a result of abusive sexual situations yeah your body is trying to tell you something exactly about the sexual situation that you're in and trying to get you out of it as quickly as possible because this this was not good sex for you no this was not sex that you wanted or enjoyed no it was nothing but anxiety it, w- it wasn't physically pleasurable while we had it it wasn't emotionally satisfying i didn't leave this situation feeling good about the relationship or, or my life and it didn't make me feel closer to r at all so it wasn't this kind of emotionally bonding experience it was just bad it was bad sex yeah. all across the board yeah 
but you were consistently made to feel that you had to do it because you needed to prove that you were not sexually deficient or unworthy. It ramped up at some point when uh, she went to a sex therapist, this very expensive sex therapist. She went to this guy a couple times and didn't tell me what they talked about. I kind of realized later that it was just to get validation that she was correct, that the problems came from the fact that I had no confidence and was not masculine enough. And so they brought me in for a third session, and that was what they talked about. And we left going, okay, with some instructions. Instructions being stop having sex. So thank goodness for that. Yeah, I know. At least that stopped. But in some ways, the sexual abuse continued, even though the sex stopped. Well, the other piece of his advice, which was perfect for R, was find ways to be more confident and more masculine. And gave some suggestions like take Taekwondo and testosterone supplements and go to the gym and do weights and stuff like that. All the kind of, you know, I started reading online. She started reading online. What are all the different ways that, what what can we do to build his confidence? So her sense of entitlement ramps up because now she's not just entitled to control you sexually and determine your sexual worth. She's entitled to control your whole personality. And as that ramps up, her responsibility declines, declines, declines until there's zero responsibility. So at some point near the beginning of the relationship, every now and then I would bring up it more so in the beginning, kind of appeal to her emotionally for to not abuse me. And she took some responsibility in the beginning saying, oh, yeah, I know this is a problem. This has always been a problem. I've mm-hmm. never had a relationship longer than two years because they always, this always happens. She stopped doing that. This was now completely necessary. That never happened. She didn't actually ever abuse people before. And she was just trying to make this relationship work. So just go back to the sexual realm, the no sex period. Yeah, five years. Five years. So, I mean, you'd only kind of had sex for three even. Yeah, no, just two. I mean, it was five years and yeah. yeah. So you only just had sex for two years and now it it stops. Yeah. But she stays, even though you said she described herself very early on as a sexual person, that sex was important to her. Mm Mm-hmm. But she's staying in this relationship where she's not getting supposedly the sex she wants at all. And you don't know how she handles that five-year drought either. No, we're not having conversations about it at all. Actually, we don't talk about it. We just completely avoid the subject. And really, it's just the focus is on making sure that I get this confidence. So how did you handle kind of any sexual urges or sexual thoughts that you had? Yeah, well, I had a huge amount of shame around the whole idea of sex. I mean, I already was not great going into that relationship, but I had moments where at least masturbation was enjoyable. But at this point, if just this, the idea of sex at all popped in my head, I got overwhelmed with shame and had to try to get out of that feeling as quickly as I, as I could. And that involved even just seeing people, seeing a woman on the street or something. Woman. It's like, nah. You know, I already said I kind of avoided that desire before, but this was like an extreme version of that where it just gave me shame. I felt terrible. If I felt any sort of sexual urge and one of the quickest ways I've found to alleviate that at least temporarily was to masturbate, but it was as quickly as I could. It was not a pleasurable thing anymore. It was a tool to just get this kind of temporary relief from shame. So there were intensified feelings of shame and fear after this two year traumatic sexual relationship and you're still in it for five more years. Yeah. So this was a period where you also kind of retreated into depression and also into alcohol as a way to kind of manage the shame and the sexual shame. Yeah. There was not a lot available to me, I didn't feel like. So yeah, I mean, alcohol was something that had worked for me in the past to just kind of get me out of moments of severe depression, even though it didn't, you know, it doesn't really work very well with that and often might wind up leading to a worse feeling of depression later. But yeah, this kind of self-destruction, I I would go between moments of feeling motivated to really uh, get after this this confidence and masculinity problem, but then feeling a huge amount of shame for that. And so just this terrible cycle that was just constantly being reinforced by R, though, even though we didn't directly talk about sex, she was still talking about all the things that she had put together that were the cause for the problems in the sex. So, you know, Indirectly, yeah, it was attacking my masculinity on a daily basis. And Eventually, you both try, I imagine it was her impetus to give it one more th- yeah. shot with a couple's therapist. Mm-hmm. 
Well, she wanted to give sex one more shot before that couples therapist, and it it picked up exactly where it left off. So I was like, okay, this no, this is still terrible. And then the idea was to go to a couples therapist to okay. figure yeah. out how to fix our sex once and for all. Yeah, once and for all. This was the therapist we've mentioned before who recognizes and names are as an abusive person in the first meeting and then goes on to p- completely ignore that abuse yes. and in fact validate R and herself the therapist contributing to the sexual trauma right so the moment that it was acknowledged in in the words abuse were used because i never used that word it was extremely validating and hopeful for me but it made R cry and the therapist seemed to back off immediately and then never brought it up again and then from there forward, it was like, how can we fix this relationship? And including how can we fix the sexual relationship, even though you yes. had just said that this was an abusive dynamic, yeah. the therapist was encouraging you and coaching you to engage engage in sex with your abuser. Yes. And one of the things that she suggested, I guess this is apparently her go-to, is that you separate for a while and you see other people, and that to include having sex with other people. Yes. Yeah, so we separate. Uh, I, I moved out of the house for three months. We're not supposed to talk for that. And it was supposed to be for a week, but... R couldn't pull that off, so she said, "Let's just do don't talk, try not to talk the entire three months." And so I start feeling amazing, but I th- I think I'm feeling amazing. No, I don't know, amazing it yeah. is is not the right word. I start feeling better pretty quickly, and I chalk it up to because I'm I'm working on myself. And we talked about that period before. I think maybe in the trauma bond because you mm-hmm. see the sexual trauma bond here as well. So R does go, in fact, start to meet other people and have sex with other people yes. immediately. You don't. No. That's not surprising because. R had made herself the linchpin, the key to your sexual worthiness. And it's not about going out and finding someone else who might have sex with you because y- you are unworthy and deficient. And the only way to get out of that hole is to make it right with R. Yeah, right. I mean, I felt completely worthless already. I mean, so anything that I felt before R was intensified by mm-hmm. 10. I, I just felt completely, there's no way anyone's ever going to want to be interested in me. Yeah, R was the only pathway for Right, so I just had to fix that. So I told myself, because I was working with other people that told me to tell myself this, that I was doing this for myself, trying to heal myself for my own sake, but that was not my motivation. So you then, again, this, this therapist sets up this kind of final sexually traumatic situation with R. Apparently R had been telling her that she was interested in BDSM, and so she says, well, this is what we're going to do. Do you trust me? I have this idea. She was in- encouraged me to try one more time, but in, in this new way, in this kind of BDSM way that she thought would, that was what R was looking for. Even though you, you didn't express any interest. I didn't express any interest in that. So I went ahead and followed her directions anyway and went on, out on this date while, while during this break and, um, and attempted to make this happen. It, it included blindfolding. And when R discovered what was going on she took off the blindfold and was like wow what's going on here like i didn't want this apparently she told me r told me that this it was disgust that she didn't want to have sex like or she at least wasn't ready whatever it was i i don't necessarily trust whatever r says but somehow the the therapist was seemed to know that that wasn't going to be welcome <laughs> in any case it wasn't welcome for it you it wasn't welcome. and it just it caused even more kind of sexual trauma and sexual shame yeah. that you had attempted this thing and been rejected and belittled one more time. The positive, though, about R going off and dating other people, having sex with other people, is apparently she recognized that she could get narcissistic validation from others, and yeah. she decides to finally call it a day. Yes, although the calling it a day meant let's just make the end of our sexual relationship official, but she still wanted complete access to me in every other way. So she wanted to me to move back in the house you know, can we be business partners? Yeah, so she wanted the end, the marriage, which was the proxy for the sexual relationship. But she wanted to, yes, keep you in the house, keep you financially supporting her, yes. keeping you emotionally supporting her, keeping you as her kind of abuse target. Yeah, because I, I moved back in the house and immediately the abuse just starts again, just like always. It's not, there's no relief of that just because suddenly we agreed to get a divorce. So you're back living with her, even though you're getting divorced. divorce. You've kind of thoroughly sexually traumatized. You have a lot of sexual shame. And thanks to social media, boy, this has been a real problem in your life, social media. Yeah. Jay finds you. So this is going longer than we had anticipated. So we may need to make this a four-parter. In any case, there's actually even more material available on our Patreon account. Yeah, I mean, I wrote quite a bit of things about these two periods that are in the Jay periods and, and the sexual 
experiences within those. I mean, it, I think it wound up being something like 40 pages. <laughs> Pretty long. <laughs> we may not we'll probably yeah. put all of it on Patreon. No, but it's, no. It's again, it's available there for people who appreciate being able to read through the material mm -hmm. and there's more details about some of the stories that you've told here and there's more stories about things that we we don't have time to cover right so it's always difficult to kind of figure out what the overarching things to say are and and yeah maybe we ran a little bit long here so if you go to patreon.com and, and look for a codependent mind or there's a link in the show notes and we'll cover in more depth the j relationship next episode including how you got out of that and then we finally get to the, the happier parts where you exit the J relationship and you're able to finally start to heal from not just the trauma, but the sexual trauma as well, which is, you know, that healing process is still continuing. It is. 